Good morning, LifeBridge. Don't trust those pictures. <laughs> those faces look innocent. They are not. If you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 11, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. I'm thankful for the opportunity, and I know uh, Luke's probably watching. If not, he will watch later. So Luke, I want to say thank you so much for the chance to open up God's Word here. I normally sit right up there at the 10 o'clock service, and uh, it is uh, different on this side for sure. But I also want to encourage us as a faith family and just to remind you, I've preached all over the world. I've studied under some of the greatest preachers this country has ever seen, and I've heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of preachers. And here at LifeBridge, I hope you understand that our pastor, Luke, is one of the greatest communicators of God's word that this country has. And so, Luke, thank you, not only for the chance to preach, but Luke, thank you for every single week, every single week, faithfully, rightly dividing the word of truth and challenging us. And as a preacher to sit there, I told John earlier, it's fun to leave every service challenged and not criticizing. Anybody, any criticizers in the house? To be able to rest in the word of God and to be able to enjoy someone deliver the word so well. And that can only happen also with our extraordinary team uh, here at LifeBridge. So if you've got a copy of God's Word, Matthew chapter 11 is where we're gonna be as we continue in this collection of conversations of truth decay. And as you know, over the last few weeks, what we've done is we've looked at some phrases that may be popular in the world and maybe even popular in the church or phrases that we've said to people that sound true or maybe even have nuggets of truth in them but aren't exactly rooted in the Word of God. Phrases like, I'm gonna walk in my truth, as if that's possible. Or phrases that we've heard, things like, uh, I, I don't know, if the more I get, you know, the, the wealthier I am or I can be. And phrases like, it's better to be safe than sorry. And phrases like, God will never, I love that one, right? God will never give you more than you can handle. Did you see that picture? Yes, he can. Amen. Every day, every day. Single day. Currently, they're watching right now because my wife is delivering a baby and my sister's at home with my kids and I have no idea what's going on. I'm very fearful at the moment that I won't have a house to come back to. So guys, listen. Last week, I was so challenged when Luke brought us to Hebrews chapter 12 and this idea that I don't know if it's inspired by you know, 21st century philosopher Kelly Clarkson or the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And sometimes in, in Luke encouraged us that, that we don't think about that anymore, that our society and our world, it really is we can never talk about having weaknesses whatsoever and how the call of Jesus Christ is to persevere and that even as we're following hard after Jesus with a great cloud of witnesses to throw off sin that so easily constrains us, any kind of distraction that we have. And Luke challenges us with the thought that discipline that comes from the Lord is not a bad thing because we're children of God. And while discipline may hurt, it's never intended to harm. Like physical therapy on any part of the body, hurt is part of the process of healing. And this morning, I wanna challenge us looking at this passage in Matthew chapter 11, not when sin may creep into our lives, but this thought, this statement that's been made that you probably hear, and you can say it after me when we get done. Are you ready? Here we go. Whenever God closes the door, he always opens a window. <laughs> and in some regards, friends, we know this. We use that phrase as an encouragement when some things don't work out and we know God is good and another opportunity may come. But here's my question for you. What if the door never opens again? What happens when there is no window? And what good is a window if I need a door? What will we do when life doesn't really work out the way that we thought it was going to work out. Is there anybody in this room who understands what I'm saying? 
In Matthew chapter 11, we come across John the Baptist, not because he wasn't Presbyterian, but because he was the baptizer. And in Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse one, read along with me, not out loud, because that gets confusing. Here we go. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John heard while he was in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his own disciples and said to him, this is John's disciples to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another one? And Jesus answered these disciples to take this message back to John Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the good news preached to them. And one of the most intriguing statements that Jesus has ever made that's boggled my mind for years. The last thing that Jesus ever says to John he says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Uh, okay. <laughs> what? Jesus, I asked a simple yes, no question. Are you the one? Have I wasted my whole life? Are you the one or is there another? Have I missed it? And Jesus said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. God, I thank you for this faith family. I thank you for our pastors, our elders, our staff. I thank you for every volunteer who is helping with our kids' ministry, student ministry. God, what an awesome place. What an awesome time to be here at LifeBridge. I thank you that you led my family here over a year ago to be a part of this place. And God, I pray even in this moment and in this morning that we have together that, that you remove me. Don't allow me to be a stumbling block to the truth of your word. God, work in our hearts like never before. God, help us. Help us realize that even when life doesn't seem to work out the way that we thought it should, even when doubts and disappointments creep into the very essence of who we are, you are still a good God. And you are worthy to be worshiped. We praise you, we love you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. On January 6, 2014 was one of the greatest days of my life. 6.15 in the morning, and I am awoken, awakened, awoken, one of those things. My wife wakes me up. There we go. My wife wakes me up. Says four words that we have been waiting years to hear. I think I'm pregnant. And in the loving, compassionate, excited phrase of where I stay, state of mind, where I'm at, I look at her and say, you are a world-class physician. You are a board-certified OBGYN. You are a professor of a medical school. How in the world can you say, I, I think <laughs> I'm pregnant? This is kind of what you do for a living. What do you mean you think you're pregnant? And so after four tests, it confirmed we were pregnant. We were excited. After several years of wrestling with infertility and prayers and prayers, we said, thank you, Jesus. But as often happens, and maybe some of you can understand in this room, just a few weeks later this week, 10 years ago, after we were doing lots and lots of scans, because one of the beautiful parts of being married to an OB is that I can go and we can do ultrasounds anytime we want to, we heard four more words that our friend came and confirmed for us, there is no heartbeat. And in that moment, after prayers and after 
praising God. There's no seminary degree that prepares you for the heartache, the gut punch that happens deep within your soul. And God whispered something to my broken spirit in that moment that I will never let go of. And in that moment, what I heard from the Lord was simply this. Will you still worship me? And because, you know, uh, I'm super spiritual, I said, no. You, you've got to be kidding me. I would rip the heart out of my own chest and I would give it to them. How, God, after all these years of praying and following, do you give us this glimpse of hope and happiness and both my babies are gone? Standing at a crossroads between what I know to be true about God and what I'm currently experiencing in that moment, God whispers, will you still worship me? For a decade, I've wrestled with that. I've often wondered what could happen. We've heard the phrase. And in those moments, well, God seems to have closed the door, but I want that door. God, shut a door, and even if there is a window, I, I want that door. I feel like this may be where John is in the moment here in Matthew chapter 11. In the quietness of his pain, my pain, your pain, the Lord is asking, am I enough? Can we still see him as glorious when his goodness seems so far away? Will we trust his faithfulness even in the midst of fearfulness? Will we say yes to his direction when a no means I'm never going to be a daddy, and maybe not you either. I'm convinced that the most dangerous temptation, at least in my own life, is that I give God my heart's affection over the gifts that he gives me, but not my heart's affection to the gift giver. And that more often, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to even admit that, that so often my own obedience is influenced about getting something from the Lord. But I'm so thankful that God's faithfulness to us is not dependent on our faithfulness to him. So my friends, here's the deal. What do we do when the door never opens? What do we do when doubt and disappointment creeps to the every crevice of our life? What are we gonna do? And I love this about John because when you think about John's life, he sends a question that everybody was asking to Jesus. Jesus, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? The shocking thing about the question is not that he asked it. It's the fact that John knows who Jesus is. We know this from the very beginning of John's life. Can I show this to you? Say yes, because I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Luke chapter one, we know all about John's life. John's mom and dad weren't able to have a baby. His dad, Zachariah, was a priest. His mother, Elizabeth, was barren. An angel came and visited them in, John, in Luke chapter one and said, you're gonna have a baby. And they're like, <laughs> we old. It's also what I said. Y'all saw my kids, like I'm old. And I got little ones. But that's the beauty of what we see here. John's life started as a miraculous birth. The Bible says in Luke chapter one that the, the, the angel spoke to Elizabeth and Zechariah and said, he's gonna be great in the sight of the Lord. He's gonna turn the hearts of the people back to God. And we know all the people in the community knew who John was and how miraculous his birth would be, how remarkable his ministry was gonna be. It says in Luke chapter one, verse 65, fear came over all of the neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with them. Y'all, that's some pressure. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The entire community knows that you are a, a miracle in your birth. 
The entire community knows, not just your parents, that God has this tremendous ministry for you. But here you are sitting in prison asking, what in the world happened? But it's not just the community. It's not just the, the, the parents of John. John knows exactly who he is and what he was born to do. He says this repeatedly in the word of God. In John chapter one, John says this. Some religious leaders came to him and said, who are you? You've been out here preaching, wearing crazy stuff, eating crazy stuff, calling people brood of vipers. What's your deal? Are you the Messiah? And John says, in John chapter one, he says, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, then what are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. And they said to him, who are you so that we can tell those people who sent us? He said, I am a voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He's quoting from Isaiah. John knows very clearly who he is and what he came to do. And do you remember in John chapter three, he said the exact same thing. They came to him, it's like, whoa, 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 who are you? What have you come to do? He said, I'm the one who came before the Messiah. I'm the one to make the path straight. And, and when I see the Messiah, my joy has been made full. And in John chapter three, verse 30, you know, you remember this one? He says, I must decrease so that what? He must increase. John had a firm understanding of who he was and what his role was. And he knew who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. Over and over, John was clear. In John chapter one, when Jesus walked by, do you remember what he said? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, let me just kind of, rush over your head like, okay, lamb of the day. It's a deeply, deeply theological statement. He's pointing that that man right there, that's the one we've waited for this whole time. That's the one that's going to bring us the freedom that we so long for. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But you know what I find fascinating in Luke chapter one? We find one more thing. John knew this from a very early age, who he was and who Jesus was. Do you remember what happened when Mary, the mother of Jesus, made her way to Elizabeth's house? She left her home, went to spend time with Elizabeth, and the Bible says, she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth Mary heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside of her womb, you remember this? jumped, leaped, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she cried out with a loud voice saying, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Friends, John and Jesus had a prenatal party. So here's my question. What would cause a man who clearly knew from the very beginning of his life what his role was, what he came to do? What would cause a man who knew exactly who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do, who could point him out, who let his own followers follow Jesus and said, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What would cause a man to be in prison and say, are you the one? Can I offer this to you this morning that I don't think John is much different from us? The same things that bring about doubt and disappointment into our life is what John is dealing with as he sits in prison. What would cause a man to begin to doubt the identity of Jesus as Messiah? Same thing for us. We go through something in our life, it's an unfair experience that we deal with. Maybe for you, you're following Jesus, you're doing things the right way and you continue to get passed over for a promotion because the other person's not doing things the right way. Can, can anybody smell what I'm stepping in? Maybe 
You've trusted Christ and prayed over and over and over for a wayward child who still hasn't come home. And you're asking God, can you even do something? Maybe it's a loss of a child when you got so excited. Maybe it was obeying Christ brought you to a place of disappointment. Maybe obeying Christ brought you to a prison instead of a palace. Maybe you thought obedience to Christ would bring some pleasures in this world, and yet it brings persecution. This is where we find John. What unfair experience. Well, we don't know, but in verse two, it tells us that John heard about Jesus while he was in prison. Well, why was he in prison? We find out about that in Matthew chapter 14. This is what scripture says why John is in prison. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him, for Herod had seized John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Why? Why did he throw him in there? What was he doing? Because of this. Because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came along, the daughter of Herodias, she danced before the company and it pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And you remember what happened? Anybody, anybody Bible scholars? Her mama told her, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter, y'all. If that ain't a true crime documentary, (laughs) I want his head on a platter. And because Herod had made an oath in front of all these people that he would do that, that's what happened. And John's head was removed from his body and his disciples came and took him and they buried him and they went and they told Jesus How can somebody who is so confident in who he is and what he came to do and so confident about who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do ask, are you the one? Because doing what is right brought him to a place of persecution in prison. And I'm here to tell you, and maybe maybe you've got it all figured out, but doubt and disappointment creeps into my life when I look around and go, God, God, why? Why can't you do that in my life? God, what did I do wrong? God, maybe if I just prayed a little bit more, my babies would be here and turning 10 in September. Maybe maybe I didn't confess enough of my sins to you. God, what did I do wrong? Why is the door not open? And maybe you don't struggle with that. But if you live long enough following Jesus, you're gonna come across some unfair experiences in your life and it's gonna be a moment of doubt and disappointment. But it wasn't just doubt and disappointment from an unfair experience. John also had an unfulfilled expectation of what Jesus was to do. If you think about it, After 400 years of silence, here's this man coming out of the wilderness and he's preaching and he's pointing people to the Messiah. This is the guy. But the common understanding of what the Messiah was going to do for the people of Israel was not come in and say, I came to be a servant and not be served. The overwhelming understanding of most of the people in the first century of who the Messiah would be was somebody who's gonna come in with military force and he's just gonna ransack all of of the Roman Empire and be able to say to them, this is not it. There will be freedom. These are the passages that the Messiah has spoken about throughout scripture. We know this, we've seen this over and over and over. The Bible tells us In Isaiah chapter 29, in that day, this is what's gonna happen. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing and the scoffer will cease and all who watch to do evil, they will be cut off. That's what the Messiah is gonna do. Isaiah chapter 35 says, behold, your God will come with vengeance. 
and he's going to save you. Isaiah 61, the very passage that Jesus quotes that the spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Goes on to say this, that the, the, the Messiah will proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Hallelujah, let's go. You know that's what John's thinking. Are you the Messiah? Because if you are the Messiah, why have you not set the captive free? Plus, we're related. <laughs> why haven't you done for me what I expect you to do? And I often wonder if it's not the unfair experience, it's the unfulfilled expectation that I have on Jesus myself. Friends, life doesn't always work out on this planet. Can I get ahead now? Can somebody, my love language is words of affirmation. So I just kind of need you right here. Sometimes the doors don't open. Sometimes the windows never crack open. And I want to know what will you do when doubt and disappointment creeps to the very core of who you are? Will you still worship him? When Jesus doesn't do what we think he should do in our lives or when he doesn't show up the way that we think he should, we may ask, are you really the one? Is it really worth it to follow you? Maybe if I could have prayed more, if I could have done this, if I could have, could have said that, if I could have just, how about this one? Just have a little more faith. But here's the beauty and the brilliance of who Jesus is. It's in the response that we see the love and the mercy of God and the answer to the question, what should we do? Matthew chapter 11, verse two. I don't want us to overlook this. What do we do in these moments of doubt and disappointment? The Bible says in verse two, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to them, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Friends, here's what I wanna encourage you with. If you're dealing with those doubts and the disappointments and you're unsure, God, where are you? Look at me. Take the doubts to Jesus. Our God is big enough to handle all of your complaining and my complaining, which I do a lot. He's big enough to hear from the depths of your heart. I don't understand why can't you do this? God, I, I trust you. Why, why won't it work out? John could have wallowed in self-pity with all those doubts creeping in, causing him to doubt over and over until his head was removed. But instead, he was bold enough to say, Jesus, I don't know. Have I wasted it all? What would help me? And friends, we live in a culture that simply says, pull yourself up. You got this. As long as I tell myself and affirm myself every morning, everything's gonna work out. It's not. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. So take the doubt and the disappointment, lay it at the feet of Jesus and said, I need you. Do work in my heart. What are you doing? I need you. You see, friends, doubt and disappointment can either drive us to despair or it can drive us to deepen our dependence on Jesus. You and I have to make that choice of what will this doubt do in our life? But listen to what Jesus said. <laughs> because Jesus does what Jesus does. John asked a yes, no question and Jesus didn't give a yes, no reply. Did you catch that? <laughs> I get y'all get frustrated like that sometimes? Surely not. John said, Are you the one or should we expect another one? Simple answer, Jesus, yes. That's all I'm looking for. Just a yes. And I'll go on with my life until my head is removed. But this is what Jesus says, and I love this. 
Jesus says, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus said, in your moment of doubt, you can trust the word and my works. John, it may not look like it. You may not understand. You may have an expectation that hasn't come to pass, but I am who the word says that I am. I have done what the word says I came to do. Trust me. What's ironic about what Jesus says is he points to the miraculous that he's done that the Messiah was supposed to do and he left out all of the parts in those same passages about vengeance and rescuing people from the prison. You see in the beauty of what Jesus is doing, the hope that he's offering is this. Just because I'm not who you want me to be doesn't mean I'm not who I am. And I think some of us this morning, if we're honest, we came in here with a lot of disappointment, hoping that God would do something in our lives that he has chosen not to do. And friends, I'm here to say to you, when he asks, will you still worship me? I pray your heart says yes. This last verse that baffles me. Jesus says to John, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. What? What do you mean? Take offense or, or, or stumble is what the word is. What are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean, blessed, if, I, if I'm not offended? You just confirmed that you're the Messiah, so do what the word says you're gonna do. Do that in my life right here, right now, this way. Do that. But friends, here's what I believe Jesus is saying to John. He's saying to John, 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 yes, I'm the Messiah. Yes, you accomplished your mission. You paved the way. You made the path straight. You've done all that I've asked you to do. Well done, good and faithful servant. But I'm not coming to get you. And friends, this is where the sovereignty of the Almighty rubs against the sensibilities of humanity. We want the perfect ending for John. He's the faithful servant. We want him to be saved from destruction. We want Jesus to kick down the prison doors and run out with him and everybody celebrates and the curtain closes. But sometimes the doors don't open. And I want to ask you, we want our babies back. We want our jobs back. We want our loved ones back. We want the sicknesses to end. We want the pain to end. We just want them to fix it. Fix it now. And as you cry out to Jesus, he whispers softly, I'm not changing this circumstance right now. When the door closes, what will you do in the hallway? And my prayer is that all of us walking through difficult times will allow our doubts and our disappointments to drive us to deeper dependence upon Jesus. When Jesus says no, will you still say yes? He's not only worthy of our worship, he is worthy of following him, even if it's not a palace and it's a prison. Even if it's not being lifted up and my head is up or having my head lifted off my body, he is worthy of our worship. The seasons of sorrow and the seasons of grace intertwine. That Christ meets us at every single turn. And so I beg you this morning. Sometimes he doesn't open a door. Sometimes the window stays shut. 
but he's still the Messiah. He's still good. And just because this life may not look like it's supposed to look in your mind doesn't mean it's not a good life. Because wherever Jesus is and lives and reigns, there is goodness. I don't know where that strikes you. A day, a, a day doesn't go by. I don't think about what those twins would look like. Would they look like my wife with her curly hair, which is what I pray for? <laughs> Would they be smart like their mama and not hyper dramatic like their dad? And I spent years, guys, years. They say time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. Time doesn't heal the wound. Time allows you to have... <laughs> a new way of looking at things, a new perspective. But here's what I know. Almost every single week, I still hear God pressing that little question on my heart. Will you still worship? When you're a stay-at-home dad now of four children between the ages of seven and four, and they're stair-stepped on Friday, seven, six, five, and four. When your boys, after eight years of being in the adoption process, finally come home in August in the middle of trying to finish your dissertation. When life throws you curveballs, <laughs> when you're not sure you're a good enough parent because you're going crazy. Anybody, in the, anybody, anybody? Will you still worship him? Take your doubt to Jesus. Trust his word and turn to him. He's good. Let's pray. God, we love you. I thank you that despite our frailty, despite our, sometimes Lord, our lack of being honest with you, you still are right there waiting and willing to answer everything that we, ha we have to ask you. And God, we know sometimes the answers aren't what we want. So in those moments, God, help us. Help us trust you. You are good even when the situation isn't good. And while we're not promised all these things in this life, we know it's worth following you because we have eternal life with you. Oh God, help us be men and women who walk out on a daily basis and we worship you regardless of our circumstances. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's respond to the Lord.